Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Ties Fundamental Value Podcast. Uh, we're doing another live episode, which we're super excited about. I'm here with Joel Edgerton, who's the uh, COO of Bitflyer USA. Um, and so, you know, for, for those of you who, who already know the podcast, you know, just can, you know, don't need to really go into the intro, but, you know, the whole idea behind fundamental value is, is you know, interviewing the leading, you know, hedge funds, analysts, you know, exchanges and digital asset market participants, really trying to answer the question of how do we actually define fundamentals for crypto and how do we derive a, a fair valuation of this asset class? So before we even get into it, just a quick disclaimer, uh, this podcast was recorded and is being made available solely for informational purposes. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions provided in this podcast should not be construed as a provision of investment advice or as an offer to buy or sell any securities or tokens or to make or consider any investment or course of action. You can view our show notes for our complete disclosures. Wow, I'm, I actually memorized most of that at that point. I'm impressed myself. <laughs> good. So, Joel, thanks for being here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. No problem. I appreciate you asking me to come. And so you have an interesting um, background. You know, I was going through your LinkedIn. You started as a project manager at IBM. You went to State Street. You started your own firm at some point. And eventually, you, you, you served as the COO and CDO of uh, BNP's uh, insurance company. So we'd love to kind of hear about who, who Joel Edgerton was before, you know, all the movies, all the stardom and crypto. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was the movie star. No, uh, I'm not nearly as good looking as the movie star. Not nearly as rich as the movie star either. Well, that's, no, why, I, that's why I normally do podcast episodes, uh, audio, because <laughs> I'm not, uh, not as good looking for the, for the live ones. So I apologize to anybody watching. I hope Joel shows a lot bigger on the screen. <laughs> cool. No, I mean, I started in IT at IBM. Um, just kind of fell into it, to be honest, uh, and really, really enjoyed it. Then I decided to go get a master's degree in international finance. Um, I was always interested in Asia, so I, I specialized in Japanese as well. And then, as you already mentioned, um, I worked for State Street for a while. I worked for Citigroup for a while. Um, so I've done trust banking. I've done custody. Uh, I've done asset management, capital markets, insurance. Um, so pretty much everything but retail banking um, I've done. So I, I worked in Tokyo for around 12, 13 years. I worked in London for around five years, particularly in capital markets. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. Um, but crypto is, is definitely much more interesting than insurance, I can tell you that. Yeah. So what was the, the, what was your first experience with crypto? Do you remember the first time somebody mentioned Bitcoin or you saw it and you know, what eventually led you down the rabbit hole? Because uh, you, you just joined Bitflyer what, about a year ago or so. Yeah. No, I, I actually started following it probably around 2012, maybe. Um, actually BNP Paribas was really big and early into blockchain. So they actually have their own internal blockchain uh, group. Um, and they've actually got some products out on the wealth management side using blockchain technology. So, you know, I heard about it quite early within uh, BNP Paribas. Um, and there was a, a guy that sat next to me uh, by the name of Glenn Gilbert. Uh, and he and I used to always talk about, you know, blockchain and what's going to be the impact on, on finance and how things are going to change. And then obviously that got into Bitcoin conversations about you know, it's crazy. It's hit $600. Oh my God, it can't go any higher than $600. Um, yeah. So a lot of early days just discussing and talking about it. Uh, really wish I had invested, but my wife would have killed me at the time. And so what, what, when, when did you decide that, you know, you were ready to kind of make the jump into crypto full time? And why did you decide to uh, leave BNP to join uh, Bitflyer in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, everybody's always looking for a, a challenge in their career. Um, I left for a while to start my own company that was looking at um, individual investment behaviors and using uh, behavioral finance algorithms to kind of help people make better investment decisions. So I've always been kind of interested in, you know, the cross between technology and finance. Um, and, you know, once you get into blockchain, I think, People in traditional finance, when they, they hear about blockchain, maybe they get it a little bit faster because they can see the problems that it's solving within finance because it's solving a lot of different problems within finance. Um, the idea is that you can uh, eliminate, you know, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that you have just checking data, uh, all the different ledgers and everything and, and making those transactions just faster and, and relying on the code 
rather than, you know, all of these processes and everything that have been stuck. In it. It's just very, very inefficient. So blockchain was just obviously better um, when, when I started hearing about it. Um, it was just a matter of, you know, building it for the right uh, use cases and finding uh, the ways that can really add value to people. Uh, and, and I think a company like Bitflyer, where they've actually done that, they've actually built um, their, their own technology, their, their, they have their own blockchain technology as well, um, as well as using the Bitcoin uh, chain as well. It, it's just nice to see it actually implemented in, in, in use and, and affecting people's lives. And in Japan, it, it actually has a, quite a big impact because if you go into an electronics store in Japan, you can buy electronics today using Bitcoin. I mean, they have a big Bitcoin sign over the cashier where you can just go in and, and say, okay, I want to buy Bitcoin, which, you know, you really can't do that today. You can't go into a Best Buy and say, I want to buy this computer with Bitcoin. Well, Japan is already in place. It's already there. And do you think that that's a, uh, you know, before we go back in your background, that's a use case for Bitcoin that you think it should be used for day-to-day -day transactions? Um, I think it, it definitely has a use case there. I don't think it's mature enough to, to do that. Um, and I think there's some psychological barriers to do that. I mean, you have to get people used to the idea of pricing things within Bitcoin and understanding what that price means. And, you know, in the U.S., we've been pricing things for a long time in dollars. So just changing that behavior, I think, is very difficult. I mean, I also, you know, I think about the scaling issues, right? And the scalability issues and the, the cost issues and, and the, the speed issues as well, right? When you think about Bitcoin as, as transactional, right? You know, like, I, you know, I, I actually lived in Hong Kong and uh, growing up and we had this thing called an Octopus card and they've had it for 20 years. And basically when you go on the Metro, you have a little card, you just tap it. You go into a store, you just tap it. You go to a parking lot, you just, you know, a parking rod, you just tap it. And it's, super easy it just pays for thing and and like you know to me it's like does bitcoin solve for those same issues and should it solve for those same issues you know and obviously we'll get into that more later but would love to kind of get your initial thoughts yeah um actually the same technology of that card is in japan uh and is everywhere, everywhere. in asia yeah yeah so it's not a a big deal um i i i think there's two ways right there is as you said the obvious infrastructure issues which is something that can be solved with time. Um, you know, the, the early days of the internet when you had to dial up with all the noises and everything like that was a horrible customer experience. There was no infrastructure, nobody used, knew how to do anything. But over the last few decades, you know, the infrastructure's built out, people got used to it. So, you know, over time, I think you can change that. Um, I think there's a little bit larger psychological barriers to changing people's behaviors on the retail side to get them to price things. You know, are they going to really go buy gasoline in, in sats? Um, you know, getting people used to that. I mean, the U.S. tried to move to the metric system in the 1970s, and that failed miserably. So, you know. Yeah. Trying to convince Americans to do anything is a challenge. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that point. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so let, well, let's go. Let, we'll come back to that. But we'd love to kind of go in more into, into Bitflyer and and. You know, starting with like what what you are the COO of Bitflower USA. What does that mean, and what does that mean your responsibilities are in your day to day? Yeah, so Bitflower is a unique animal, right? So our headquarters is in Japan, so we're we're the largest crypto exchange in Japan, um, but in the U.S. we're very very small. So we kind of have this you know mothership in Japan that's kind of very corporate, but in the U.S. we're quite small and, and more of a startup. So. There's a clash of cultures and communication that's there beyond just the clash of cultures and communication between America and Japan and everything else. So it's quite difficult. So I do a lot of kind of communication and handholding and getting stuff done, but also with the crypto exchange, um, you know, I have to be involved in operations. I need to be involved in finance. I need to be involved in compliance. Um, and if you look at our team, like half of our team is compliance. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different hats that you need to wear as a CEO. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the number one thing is taking care of our customers. So I'm constantly talking to both our institutional and retail customers and trying to understand, you know, what are the problems they're facing, apologizing when we screw up uh, and looking for new opportunities to grow the business. 
And so what are the biggest challenges associated with being the CEO? I mean, I think you've hit on a few of them. Um, and so maybe that maybe a better question would even be, what are the biggest challenges being part of an exchange broadly? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and especially being part of an exchange that's in the United States and subject to you know, a regulatory regime that, that has a lot more stringent rules, especially at the state by state level than you may have in, in other markets. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh, let's, let's start with the regulatory topic, right? So uh, th there's no clear rules in the U S um, for how to handle, uh, um, cryptocurrency. So we're treated as kind of a money services business, which means we're regulated on the state level. Um, and the States have different ways of looking at it. So what it means is when we're rolling out products, we need to look at the implications in, in all the states that we do business. So we do business right now in 47 states and we're soon gonna be in 48. So that's 48 regulators I need to make sure I'm not stepping on their toes and, and getting in trouble with. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. While in Japan, right, it, there's one national regulatory regime that has yeah, to be- Yeah, say, uh, yeah. Um, so it's much, much easier to deal with Japan uh, when it comes to regulations and stuff like that. And so, you know, um, I, you hit on it as well, but, you know, you have a lot of experience with KYC and due diligence from from previous roles. And I'm sure also because that is literally half of operating an exchange in the U.S., I think, right, is making sure unlike BitMEX, you don't violate the Bank Secrecy Act and you actually KYC your customers. And so what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and what are your thoughts on the implications of that more broadly for the crypto industry? Um, you know, when I was working at BNP Paribas, I was actually in London when they got hit with what, a $9 billion, $8.9 .9 billion fine for a uh, violation of KYC, AML and uh, sanctions. Um, and I was actually the program manager that was responsible for cleaning up a lot of that stuff. Um, so I was, really right in the middle of it, having to deal with US regulators and the, the European regulators. And I was in London, so I had to deal with the FCA as well. Um, and, and they're not playing around with this at all, right? Um, you're talking about their currency, you're talking about their economy, you know, they're not playing around with that in the slightest. So, you know, when it comes to BitMEX, it was completely inevitable that they would get smacked down um, for what they were doing. Um, and we have an obligation to society and our customers to protect them, right? Laws sometimes don't make sense. Uh, and the implementation of laws sometimes don't make sense. But generally, there was a purpose behind that, and that was to protect the customer. Um, and there's nothing wrong with protecting the customer, right? You can argue about how you want to do it, but the idea of protecting a customer, there should not be any argument about that. And Bitflyer's point of view is we want to take the hard road. Right. We don't want to, you know, do like some of the exchanges and try to do uh, regulatory arbitration and go to the countries that have, you know, the least structure. And, you know, you don't uh, want to be able to bribe regulators with coconuts, just like yeah, Arthur Hayes is doing. <laughs> we don't want to deal with that, with that stuff. Right. That, that's not good for a company and it's not good for the industry. And we believe in this industry and we believe in growing the industry um, and doing that type of thing is just. It's just dumb. I mean, it's just dumb. I like it. I like how blunt you put it. So I'm, I'm on the same page as you. Um, mm -hmm. And so do you expect that we will continue to see, um, you know, specifically, obviously, you're in the US, but you have so much global experience, you know, within the US, do you think we'll see a lot of noise from the SEC, CFTC, you know, I mean, even the DOJ, I mean, you know, was involved in this case of BitMEX. Do you think, you know, that we're going to see a lot, you know, coming up? And what about you know global regulators like the FCA in the UK, which you mentioned, or the FSA in Japan, or the Singapore Monetary Service Authority, or anything else? You know, how do you think how do you think different regulators are are going to, you know, either react to this news, but but also follow up on a lot of this? Um, I think the regulators will enforce their laws. Um, to be honest, crypto was relatively small for a while. I mean, if you think about it, that Apple has a a, a larger market cap than the entire crypto industry. And it wasn't really, <laughs> really. So, I mean, it, it wasn't really on their radar for a while. It, it didn't have enough, a big enough impact. So now that it's gotten bigger, it's showing up on their radar. Um, they will absolutely enforce the law because this is about control and about power, right? 
Um, the government needs control of the currency to influence the economy. The economy helps politicians get elected, right? So, you know, if you just want to play like a, a, just a pure real politic example, they're not going to give up on that power to control the economy. And that's one of the cases that Satoshi was making in, in blockchain, with the blockchain technology in Bitcoin, is the separation of money from uh, state, right? By separating money from state, then the state cannot take away your wealth, right? Um, they can't cause really high inflation and, and have your assets just disappear over time. And that's beginning, to, that's what you're beginning to see in the US, right? Um, the Fed just recently changed their policy to accept a higher inflation rate. And it means everybody that's holding assets, and particularly in the currency, is going to be in trouble over time. That asset will be worth less and less as far as real goods that it can buy. Um, so Bitcoin was the, the solution to that from Satoshi's perspective. It's something that cannot be manipulated. It is something that's set and, and you can trust the code. Um, so I think the, the, the value in this is there's going to be a conflict between the governments and the cryptocurrency um, pioneers. And at the end of the day, the governments are going to win. Um, particularly in the, the larger countries. The U.S. has no incentive to allow cryptocurrency to uh, upset its control over the financial um, world. EU the same. China wants to get involved and control its area. All the major currencies um, will be regulated. There's no way to get around that. Yeah, and I, look, I, I'm I'm totally on the same page with you in, in terms of crypto as well. As much as you know, look, I'm libertarian as basically everybody in this space is, right? And you know, I believe in the idea of of freedom and and you know from from government control and having an asset that's not as inflationary and all of that. But to your point, I mean, it has become so easy for governments to track digital assets, especially when they flow to KYC and exchanges, which everybody's going to have to do, or just like you know. BitMEX, you will get in trouble, right? If you're violating the Bank Secrecy Act, you're violating the Bank Secrecy Act, right? So, you know, you know, I think that governments will try to clamp down things. And when I think of regulatory risk, and I'd love to hear your thought, you know, I don't look, a regulator can't really seize your Bitcoin in cold storage. Like, I wouldn't be so concerned with that. The concern that I have is that regulators can stop the free fiat on ramps, right? And if you shut down the fiat on ramps, if you shut down your Bitflyers and your Coinbases and your you know, and your BitMEXs and all these different exchanges where fiat is flowing into this ecosystem, you know, to me, that's kind of the biggest regulatory risk that we have. But, but broadly speaking, I think that regulators coming into the space and, you know, we saw it with the CFTC the other day with Ethereum and, and taking more of a, hey, we want to make sure that customers are protected and people are complying with laws. I don't, I think is a good thing for the space, but, 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 but I do, I, like, I don't foresee there being a risk of like government seizing crypto. I mean, because you can't. I mean, I would love your perspective on that, though. Um, I mean, to some extent, government can't, but to some extent, it can, right? So there have been cases where, um, uh, like, for example, the takedown of Alpha Bay on the dark nets and stuff like that, where, you know, they've been able to seize assets in, in the past, right? They've been able to seize uh, wallets. Maybe they didn't have the keys and they couldn't do anything with it, but they right. blocked you from getting access to it. Right. Or they managed to, uh, you know, raid a company and, and get control of the keys as well. Right. right. So, right. you know, it is possible. It's just more difficult for them, but right. it is right. still right. possible, right? Right. So no, no even, I'm, I'm in agreement. Yeah. But even like BitMEX, right? So maybe they can't attack BitMEX through the blockchain, but they can, you know, wipe out its domain, right? So nobody can access it on the internet. Um, so, I mean, there's other ways to enforce the laws and, and they will find those ways to enforce the laws. Yep. And I think the, the other point here that is not talked about a lot in cryptocurrency is also taxation, right? So, um, governments, you know, when the internet came about and e-commerce came about at first, there was no taxation on it and it grew and there was a lot of innovation and lots of good things happened. Amazon built up. And then, you know, recessions hit and governments lose their tax money and they're like, hey, you know, this internet thing is making lots of money. Let's start taxing that. And suddenly we've got, you know, state by state taxation of all, all e-commerce um, around. So, you know, there, there is going to be taxation as well. And if there's money to be involved for governments, then they will enforce the currency so they can collect their tax money. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you. And if you haven't paid your crypto taxes, go pay them. Um, and, you know, and, and, and also, I mean, I just can't even imagine the nightmare all these people that are doing like liquidity mining on DeFi are going to have with taxation. Oh, yeah, I yeah. mean, I'm just like, uh, I feel bad. I, I, I mean, I'm friends with like Zen Ledger. Uh, shout out to Dan Hannum. He's coming on the podcast in a few days. Mm -hmm. I was the COO of Zen Ledger. And I don't even know how they're going to help clients deal with all of this taxation because the second that you take profit that's taxable i mean we saw this in 2017 right where people were made so much money trading crypto right they made 50 million bucks but never paid taxes on it and then they put that into other things and those things crashed and you're still taxed on the profit that you had before and now they had less money than just what they were taxed on so make sure to uh make sure you're doing your taxes <laughs> is uh is a great is a great uh point to make I mean, I suggest, I think uh, um, a lot of the tax attorneys in the crypto space are going to be making lots of money. They're the ones that are going to be doing really, really well. First, it was lawyers, and it continues to be, to your point on having half your team in compliance. Lawyers are making money, and, and, and you know, people in tax accountants are going to be they're making a lot of money as well. Funny how always <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so kind of back to the whole regulation thing and, and you know, the BitMEX thing. Uh, and, and we've hit on this a little bit, but I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on what are your thoughts on, on the rise of DeFi and decentralized trading is more broadly, but also what do you think of the regulatory risk there beyond tax? I mean, just more in terms of like, you know, you know, just the risk of the actual developers building these platforms. Yeah, I really like DeFi. Um, I think there's a lot of really sexy projects going on in there, a lot of innovation. Um, I like the, the uh, automated market makers. I think that's a, a really interesting solution to the liquidity problem that they had there. Um, the ability to eliminate a lot of these intermediaries and people can kind of transact with each other. Um, that's very scalable, right? That's a very scalable solution um, because they don't have all the different issues of trust and everything that are in there. Um, but, you know, I take a little bit of a different view as far as kind of the main challenges to DeFi. Um, I mean, the regulatory piece, I think, is an unsettled question, but, you know, the, the U.S. government recently or the Department of Justice recently published a, an 82 page paper on enforcement for cryptocurrency, and they definitely mentioned DeFi in there. So they're watching that space and, and they will regulate it when they think that there's a, a case to be made there. But to be honest, I think the real risk to DeFi is, you know, just a lack of maturity. Um, all of these unaudited codes that are out there that can be manipulated. Um, the idea that, you know, also if, if you're an active trader um, and you're competing against a piece of code that's going to do the same thing every single time, you have a natural advantage. You know what, you're, what the, the other part, counterparty is going to do. So you can manipulate that situation to get them to act in a certain way and make a profit off of it. So, I mean, there, there are some definite um, disadvantages. That's interesting. I, I, haven't, I haven't heard that, but it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's publicly available code, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure there's somebody smart enough to take advantage of that. So I'm, 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 I'm totally in agreement with you there. You know, I mean, you know, look, you know, Andre's Twitter says I test in prod, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little dangerous to be testing in production. And I mean, we saw that in Q2, there were five major DeFi hacks and there was a major one, uh, you know, this past quarter as well, so. Well, I mean, the thing is, you know, he says he's testing in prod, but he's testing with other people's money, right? So point. I don't want my Good money point. to be a test, to be perfectly right. honest. It's taken me, uh, you know, many years to get it. So I don't want my money to be a test. Right. Um, but the other thing is on the DeFi side that worries me, you know, is um, there's no moat around those businesses, right? Zero, zero it's moat. Code that can be copied and then slightly changed. So you have this, you know, wonderful idea. It's solving all these problems, and you know, you do really good for a day or two, and then suddenly it's been copied and turned into something else, and then your business just crashes. I mean, that's great for innovation, right? That's a very Darwinian environment, which is great for innovation. But you're not going to build a business that way, which means it's not sustainable. I mean, how, how do you build a moat, though, in DeFi? Is there a way to? Like, like Uniswap <laughs> seems to have built a brand, which is maybe, you know, that's a moat, right, in some manner. I mean, to some extent, right? I mean, if you're totally obscure and nobody knows about you, you, you can't do it. So having some type of recognition does have some value, but not much, right? It doesn't protect you very much. Um, and I don't know the answer to your question, right? I don't know what that moat is. 
I mean, I think one decent example is like Chainlink, which you can kind of call DeFi. I mean, their partnerships have kind of become their moat, right? Where they've over the last two years just partnered with everyone and built relationships and, you know, built in feeds of data from all these different market participants and potentially that could be a moat. But I think you're totally right. Like, what is Sushi Swap's moat? Sushi Swap just copy Uniswap. Like, somebody can copy Sushi Swap and make, I mean, we're seeing it with, you know, I mean, every day it's a different food product. Like it's, uh, yeah, I think we need to get away from this food meme. It's yeah. Getting a bit irritating. Yeah. yeah but, uh, you make a good point though. I mean, um, being able to integrate into the network and, and being able to get, um, you know, those network externalities to add value, you know, I can see that as a, as a bit of a moat, um, and that it takes time to be able to do that. And once you're there, there's an inertia not to change something that's working. So I can kind of see that as a bit of a moat, but um, yeah, from a centralized exchange perspective, right? I enjoy watching DeFi because it's a lot of good ideas that we can then take and bring back into our business. Um, but, you know, let them experiment, let, you know, the people that want to lose their money, lose their money and the people that are, you know, get lucky and make a fortune, great, more power to them. But as far as like a long-term sustainable business, you know, we'll watch the innovation. We'll be kind of a fast follower on that stuff, um, but not the pioneer that's getting the arrows in the back. Yeah, and I think just one more thing before we move on that, um, you know, I think the biggest moat in crypto is community, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why Bitcoin is so successful. Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have, you know, it's not the fastest blockchain, can't handle the most transactions, but it has the biggest community of supporters. It has an amazing developer community, right? It's world renowned and recognized when you think of crypto the first thing you think of is bitcoin and i think the same thing goes with ethereum like maybe the technology behind look and i'm not a technical person so you know don't quote me on any of this but you know i've heard from others like maybe polka dots technology is better or this or that but at the end of the day ethereum has built this massive DeFi community around it it they have you know east denver that thousands of developers are showing up to right and the moat that Ethereum has built is just this community of supporters and developers and things being built on top of them. And I think when it comes to DeFi, I mean, that, those kinds of things are going to be needed. And I don't think they exist at all yet. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. I mean, to the earlier point when you introduced the podcast about trying to find fundamental value in, in cryptocurrency, um, I think, you know, that developer core is a very good sign of fundamental value, right? Um, having a team that's willing to devote their time and energy to, to build something and to continue to put their energy into it, that there's value within that. Um, so if you want to think of like valuing cryptocurrency, right, that the depth of that community, particularly the developer part of that community is a very good place to start when trying to understand the different values of it. Um, another place to look is how well they execute on things. So some of these coins are just all hype and, and you know, they're marketing and stuff with, with no real substance. Some is generous. Some is generous. Most. <laughs> Most, <laughs> Most are, are a lot of hype, but you know, you know, having a team that can actually not just, you know, come up with a great idea, but deliver and execute on that idea. That is where you start seeing real value on this. Um, and you know, can they get their test net up and running? Does it do what they actually say it's gonna do? Can they get their main net up and running? Is it doing what they actually say they're gonna do? Are they able to pull people in and build a community? And are there real projects and value being added onto it? Those are all very good signs as to the underlying value of the project and therefore a way to kind of value the coin fundamentally. Right, right. And so do you think that like, how do you quantify that, though, is the biggest challenge, right? And I, there's no right or wrong answer to this question, right? And, and maybe there is no answer. But, like, how do you quantify the value of a developer community? Like, Filecoin, you know, launched yesterday, and all of a sudden it hit a fully diluted market cap of $250 billion. Like, and, you know, certainly there's been so much development work that's gone into Filecoin over the last few years. There's a big community. There's a big community of investors. But how do you even come up with – how do you even – think about coming up with evaluation or is it just supply and demand? No, yeah. I mean, I would separate those two things, value versus price. Right. Um, I think that's totally fair. Supply and demand. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a way to signal a point in time, uh, way of thinking, but I think the best is to, to look at that price signal over time. All right. Uh, if, you know, five years from now, it, it's still at 250 billion. Okay. Then there's something really there. 
if five years from now is only 1 billion, then it was just hype. Right. Right. Fair enough. And so back to, back to DeFi, I mean, we, we, we already kind of hit on the fundamental thing. We'll come back a little bit at the end, but I think you, you touched on this well, where, where DeFi is kind of like, it's great because other people's money are being tested and testing out new things that you guys can take and you can integrate into Bitflyer. And I love that. Right. And I think that is the right way to approach it, but do you view DeFi as being competitive or more as helpful? Uh, no, I don't, I don't really see DeFi a, as a competitor. Um, I see it more as a laboratory uh, for experiments and innovation to be used, right? Um, they're identifying interesting use cases uh, for problems to be solved. They're identifying interesting ways to solve those problems. At the end of the day, you know, at Bitflyer, we're looking to, to make people's lives simpler right, and add value, right? It's not about the price of a coin, right? If our business model depends on the price of a coin, we've got a crappy business, right? Our, we need to add real value to people's lives. How do we help them make money? How do we help them save time? How do we make their life better? If we can do that, we have a sustainable business, right? If, if our business is just, you know, the price of Bitcoin, we should just pack up. Because so how do you do that? How do you bring value to people? Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a couple of different ways, right? Um, so on the institutional side, uh, in particular, you know, the early days were about, you know, collecting the liquidity necessary to do the proper trades and to, to introduce um, institutional guys into it, build out the APIs to allow the trades to happen, um, and then supporting those clients to allow them to, to have alternate trading strategies, particularly, you know, when Bitcoin was a little bit less correlated to the markets, it was a good investment um, because you can get that that kind of that by delinking these things, the different assets, you can kind of get a better strategy going. Um, and then now you've got kind of arbitration between the different exchanges and everything that's still there. Um, so there, there's some value as far as the trading strategies and pricing um, that you value, that are in there. But I think we need to find something new. Um, which is why, to be honest, I'm a little bit more excited on the retail side than I am on the institutional side. Um, on the institutional side, right, okay, we can do more derivative products. We can, you know, build better products for miners, build better products for, for different niche industries and everything like that. Um, we can get into insurance. There's a ton of use cases in insurance. But on the retail side, you know, how can we make people's lives better? Um, you know, I think here we're going to be competing against the banks, right? If you go to your bank right now, you're getting maybe, you know, 10 bips, 20 bips, 30 bips on your savings. <laughs> if you're in crypto, you're, you're getting much, much higher rates, right? You, you can get 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, depending on, you know, the asset and where you're going. So obviously, if you want to, to build up wealth, crypto makes more sense. It's just difficult to get into it. So if we can provide an easy, safe way for customers to get into crypto so they can build up wealth faster and simpler, that's a very good value that we can bring. Uh, and that's something that we should be playing with. So how do we get that yield in there beyond just trading? How do we get the yield play that's in there? How do we get loans in there and, and compete against banks? Yeah. And so, you know, on that note, I didn't have this written down, but what are your thoughts on Kraken? Um, and, and the banking license or, or, you know, whatever it was exactly that they received in Wyoming. Yeah. So they got a special purpose license, um, which I think makes it simpler for their back end. Maybe they can simplify some things on their back end. Um, they could possibly get access to the fed network. Uh, the fed still would have to agree with that. And I don't know if the fed would agree with it. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. Um, if their play is to begin to you know, position themselves as like a neo bank or something like that and, and to get in that space, it's not a bad place to be, um, to have that license and to be able to do that. Um, it kind of depends on where they're going to go with it, though. And so who are Bitflyer's biggest competitors? I know you mentioned banks before, uh, and I'd love to hear both within the U.S., but also globally. Uh, and, and, and what are you doing to differentiate versus them? I mean, I know a lot of different uh, large exchanges are integrating like Celsius Network, for example, for lending or, you know, are, are offering staking uh, or doing different types of lending. So how, how, do you, how do you make Bitflyer and then Bitflyer USA more specifically different from, from those guys, but then also from neobanks, right, and from, and from more traditional institutions? 
Yeah, so we have uh, businesses in Europe and the US and Japan. So our competitors are, are a little bit different depending on the, the region that we're competing in. So in Japan, probably our largest competitor would be like CoinCheck. Um, and they like to have kind of more coins and everything like that. Um, so they're kind of Binance like, I guess. Yep. Um, within they're, they're long tail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, within the restrictions of the Japanese government, so the right. tail's not that long, but uh, longer. How many know. assets does Bitflyer have, by the way? Um, I think in Japan we're up to around ten. Okay. So not very many. We're very conservative on listing assets. Um, I'm excited to go into that. So let's save that for later. But yeah. So. Uh, and then in the U.S., obviously Coinbase, Jim and I are kind of the, the main ones we think about. We look at Kraken as well. Um, and then in, in Europe, um, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag because we, we actually compete across all of Europe, but some of the exchanges are kind of localized to individual countries. So it's difficult to have like one particular competitor in Europe. Right, right. Yeah, when I think of Europe, I think of Bitstamp, but maybe that's more of an older kind of thought, but I feel like they've had that market, but I, in, in Switzerland, there's a lot of localized exchanges as well. So, and what, what about like a Robin hood? I mean, do you view your, I mean, obviously you have an institutional part of your business as well and would kind of love to hear how you kind of weight each one in terms of at least your mental thoughts, right? You don't need to go into what percentage of the business is what, but like how you're, you know, how you're deciding how to allocate your own time to those different, you know, types of business. And I guess, you know, as you're competing with retail and institutional, I, I, I imagine the competitors are different across both of those, you know, as well. Yeah, I mean, the in the U.S., I think the fintech space is much more active. So um, there's not really a lot of fintech competitors on the retail side in Japan, but in the U.S., obviously, we have you know Robinhood, there's Revolut, there's Etoro, um, there's a lot of different guys, you know, you know, Cash App. There's a lot of different guys kind of playing in that space for the retail side. Most of them are limited to Bitcoin. They don't really go beyond Bitcoin on the, the fintech side. Um, I think they also, yeah, the way that they run their infrastructures, a lot of it uh, seems to be kind of outsourced. They're not actually building that capability to run it themselves. A lot of it's also CFDs. Like you don't even actually own the underlying asset. I yeah, think as well. yeah. So, you know, you know, they're basically running crypto like they would, you know, stocks. Um, so I think they're just kind of catching the marketing wave rather than getting the point, um, when it comes to the FinTech guys. I like that quote. That's a, that's a good quote. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you differentiate versus let's talk about your core competitors, right? And I know you mentioned Gemini and I think it was a Coinbase or, yeah. or I forgot who it was more specifically in the U S yeah. how do you go to a U.S. consumer and say, come to Bitflyer? And why should they come to Bitflyer from a retail point of view first and then from an institutional point of view versus the other venues? Uh, I mean, to be blunt, right? When I came over to the U.S., my, my first position, my first role was essentially to clean things up and, and to rebuild the company. Um, so we've been kind of just fixing things uh, for the past year. Um, so I, I don't think we're, we're very competitive at this point. Um, as far as where we're going to go, uh, like I said, I think that the place to compete is really um, in that customer value uh, on the retail side. Where we add value is helping new customers take that bridge into the crypto world, holding their hand as they go there, making sure that it's simple, making sure it's safe. Um, so that means we're not going to have 500 coins because that just confuses people. Right? It means we're going to have a few coins that have been there for a while. They've, they've stood the test of time and we can work on the customer experience and make it simple. So focus on the basics and, and just make that very easy for our customers. And I think that's where Coinbase started and then they've kind of gone away from that now. And Coinbase is beginning to kind of copy Binance and just try to be, you know, all coins for all people. It seems like everybody's kind of, I mean, even Gemini is now going down that route a little bit. And, and, and uh, Bitstamp, which for the longest time had like four assets, is now going to go like to like 30, right? Mm -hmm. So um, why do you think that's happening? Well, there's money there. So, I mean, Binance has proven that model. If you look at the revenue streams of Binance, um, they make a lot from that tail. Um, and then, you know, if you get lucky and you have like a, you know, one out of a thousand coins or one out of a hundred coins that does well, then, you know, they catch that boom, right? So that they can, um, 
they just make more money that way. So I, I think it's, if you're looking, like I said, to build a, a business model that's dependent on the price of a coin and building a business model that's dependent on, um, you know, making money off of your customers without delivering value to them, then fine, that's a good business model. But if you're looking to deliver value to your individual customers, they don't care that you have a thousand coins because they're not going to look at them, right? There's a, a small set of customers that are looking for new coins. There are the developers and stuff like that, but it's very, very small, you know, and, and what it does is it encourages these kind of herd behavior where, you know, you get one coin that's hot, everybody goes into it, the exchange makes a ton of money off of it, and then, you know, they, they move on to something else and it's almost like a flash mob or something like that. The exchange makes money off of it, right? They did nothing, they make money off of it. Is the customer better off? Not really. Some of them made money, some of them lost money, but it's not really adding value to the whole crypto industry. I like that. I like that mentality. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's certainly value in, uh, we actually just released this giant research report um, on basically what moves the price of crypto markets, right? And looked at a bunch of different things and what was actually the most sustainable. So while exchange listings have uh, the second biggest price impact within 24 hours on average, stakings were the biggest, listings were actually the least sustainable event. So after 24 hours, almost all the time, the price of an asset actually went down following an exchange listing. So it's like boom and bust, which look, if you're a day trader, right? And, and there are plenty of people in the industry. I mean, we service a lot of them that are, you know, that's, that's great. But in terms of thinking through long-term value, you know, as we think of events, you know, the things that we've been finding you know, have the biggest, you know, impact of those sustainable things like mainnet launches and upgrades to your point earlier, mergers and acquisitions. So for example, FTX going out and buying a block folio to get access to a million daily active users that are spending like 20 minutes a day was massively valuable for the FTT ecosystem, right? And so that, that drove value. So I think to your point, you know, I think it's, you know, you know, you know, well taken. And so, you know, kind of transitioning to my next question, um, and this is the thing that you've hit on before is, you know, Bitflyer is Japanese, right? You know, when you, when I think of crypto in Japan, I think of Bitflyer, right? You know, you, I think Bitflyer has done a very good job of cementing itself as, as, you know, the unquestioned leader within that space. So how does the Japanese crypto market compare to that of the United States? Um, and, and what is the average, you know, it's a hard question, but what does a crypto trader look like in Japan? Are they young? Are they old? Mm -hmm. Are they high net worth? Like, like what, what, what are you seeing? Um, yeah, Japan's interesting. <laughs> um, there's a couple of things I think that are different in Japan than take the U.S. for example. Um, you know, in the U.S. we talk about day traders and everything like that. Japan is is way ahead on this day trading thing, right? So in Japan they have this this mythical Mrs. Watanabe. So she's a housewife that stays home. You know, her husband goes off to work and she day trades during the day, right? <laughs> That, that is a stereotype that exists in Japan um, because in Japan, traditionally women control the money, right? The, the husband goes, gets a job, gets his paycheck, brings it to his wife. She gives him an allowance and then she controls all the money, right? So that's the stereotypical traditional way things work in Japan. So, um, and the way that this worked in the past was FX trading. So Japan did a lot of retail FX trading before crypto. Um, so that infrastructure was all there. The, the retail structure to do, um, you know, buying on charts and everything like that, that all existed beforehand. So when crypto came across, it was a very easy transfer in Japan for retail traders to, to move into crypto. You know, they can read technical charts uh, just as well as anybody else. So the, the retail side of the business is very active in Japan. Um, and then that obviously built up liquidity, which then attract the institutional players into the market. Um, but the, the average Japanese retail customer, I think, is a little bit more savvy than the average one in, in other countries. And they're not as much of a hodler, right? They're more of a trader. Um, well, I think in the U.S., when we look at the retail customers, they're much more of a hodler, right? They're, they're um, very consistently buying dips, right? If you see price moves movements, it's usually because institutional guys are moving it. Uh, and the retail guys are just constantly buying and buying and buying. Um, so they don't sell nearly as much as the institutional guys do. So I think that there's some interesting points on that. Um, I think also in Japan, um, 
the the movement has been to younger and younger uh, customers, but that's actually true in both the U.S. and Europe as well. So um, we did a recent survey across all of our customer base. We've got about two and a half million customers uh, between the three regions, um, and all of the the regions saw this movement into you know the twenty year olds um, being a, a much larger segment of our customer base, and I think that's partly because you know we've simplified the products to make it easier to buy and hold uh, and uh, but definitely the, the it's moving to younger customers yeah i think that yeah really really interesting i mean it uh it feels a little bit different than the chinese market for example which is it, to me seems a bit more speculative and and the south korean market which seems to have been inc incredibly speculative during 2017 and has been a little bit slower to readopt crypto. I mean, I'm wondering, you would know a lot better than I, you know, how does the Japanese market compare to other markets in Asia? Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know the, the, the Korean market that well, so I can't really speak to that. Um, the Chinese market, I think, um, there is definitely a group of quite sophisticated retail trader in, in the Chinese market. Um, you know, I, I actually had one of uh, our customers mention to me, you know, that it's always, you know, during the weekends or, or late at night when there's big price movements because Asia is basically taking everybody's profits. So, you know, the, the money, the price will run up during the day in the U.S. and then sell off in Asia because the Asians are taking the profits on, on all the money that was put into the market. Um, and you do see that that regional behavior uh, is different and it's much more active in Asia. So being a, a com company based in Asia, our exchange in the U.S. and Europe tends to reflect the Asian prices a little bit better, I think, than, than our competitors in those markets. So we, I think, react a little bit better as far as inventory management and, the, and that kind of thing to those markets. And so how do you identify new tokens to list? Uh, like what is the starting point or the impetus for, you know, saying, hey, let me take a look at this asset or, or that even I want to have more assets on the platform? Because I know you mentioned just wanting to have a few. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, there's a couple of different things that we have to look at. Uh, we have several criteria that we go through. One of them is, um, you know, does that asset have any underlying value, right? If that asset is just, you know, a shit coin, we don't want anything to do with it. Um, there has to be a problem that we think is real and that's trying to solve. So Can you give us an example? Um, for example, um, Compound, I think, is, is an interesting one, right? So they're one of the guys that are early into the lending business, uh, and that is a real issue. We need to have the capability to, to lend and borrow money within the crypto space. And the way that they've um, used their governance token to kind of build out this market, I think is quite good. I think uh, BAT is another one that's quite good. So the basic attention token. So they have as their underlying project, um, a browser that's kind of privacy uh, focused um, where they basically share your attention with the different sponsors and you get paid for it. Um, so there, there's definitely, you know, an underlying project and value. It's not just a coin to create a coin. Um, so that's one of the things. Another one we have is obviously a compliance screen and a legal screen. If there's any compliance issues, any type of legal issues, we will absolutely avoid that coin. And is that mostly securities? Like thinking a token would be a security? Is that the biggest concern there? Or? Um, absolutely a big concern. Um, obviously under US law with the securities, it's very, very difficult. Uh, in Japan, it's very similar. They're, they're quite conservative as far as the coins that the Japanese government uh, will allow. Um, there are, we're finding that the regulators are getting a little bit easier to deal with on this. Um, you know, we've had conversations with New York and I think New York, um, they're doing good things. I think they're moving in the right direction and, you know, they're quite advanced in their thinking on coins. Um, so I think they're, they're, they're helpful to us as far as the regulations and being able to, you know, balance the, the business need and the customer production needs um, as well. And, and yeah, so how, how does your team actually go about doing this due diligence? Like, are you, um, you know, you mentioned some criteria, but are you actually interacting with teams behind these protocols? You know, are you, from a compliance perspective, are you ever actually talking to regulators about specific assets? Is there any information that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yes, we do talk to regulators about specific assets uh, in advance to make sure that there's not going to be any issues with it. Um, we do, it depends. We sometimes talk to the team. Uh, I said most of the time we probably talk to the team about the assets. If it's something that's been out there for a long time and we're just kind of slow moving into it and, you know, we weren't comfortable at first, but now we're comfortable with it. Maybe on that case, we're not going to do as much. But if it's a relatively new asset, then of course we'll we'll talk to the team and do due diligence. Um, I mean, you have to kind of remember that you know Japan is a relatively risk-averse culture, so um, we do a lot of documentation. Um, you know, is, is there a risk that this project is going to disappear one year from now, right? Two years from now, three years from now? We don't want a coin that's going to disappear a couple of years from now. We want something that's going to be around and it's a sustainable business. So it needs to have, um, you know, the, the legs to be able to, to solve a problem and, and to be around for a long time and then avoid the compliance and, and legal issues during that time as well. And so to your point on sustainability, have you ever delisted or thought about delisting an asset and what would be the reason for doing so? We've never delisted one that I'm aware of. Um, we would probably delist one if there was any um, legal or compliance risk associated with it. Um, that would definitely knock it out for us. Um, if it became kind of unpopular, like, you know, it didn't really have enough trading volume to, to sustain it in, in that case, then maybe we would drop it. And, and to that point, like, how do you actually go about attracting liquidity? the platform i mean do you are you working with market makers and offering rebates and you know how are you how are you actually going about that yeah, pretty much the same um we do talk to market makers all the time we um you know we we'll offer rebates not really much but we'll offer rebates um to get into the platform and offer liquidity you know there's also guys that um have kind of uh mirroring of liquidity we sometimes talk to them we've not really done that too much um, but also, we have a huge base of liquidity in Japan. So one of the things we're trying to do is to, to really have uh, a global liquidity pool. And so... To so as that, of now, they're separate, the U.S. and yeah. Japan, the Japanese liquidity yeah. pool. Yeah, so I mean, if you're doing U.S. dollar BTC and you're doing Euro BTC and you're doing JPY BTC, it's all BTC, right? right. Um, what's keeping them all apart is the, the fiat rails are different and moving the money is a pain in the butt. Um, so we're looking at behind the scenes to solve those issues, to allow uh, to a truly global uh, trading. So, you know, if a customer is in the U.S., whether in Japan, whether in Europe, it doesn't matter. They can get access to the same liquidity pool. So we've actually rolled out the beginning of this solution in, in Europe um, to allow some of our European customers to trade onto the Japanese exchange um, without having to be, you know, onboarded in Japan and deal with Japanese banks and everything like that. We take care of all that complexity behind the scenes and to have that global liquidity. Um, so, it, so are you guys not, do you guys not have stable coins then? Cause I feel like one of the thing that connects globally, you know, a lot of these exchanges and obviously there are risks and I'd love to kind of get your perspective on why you don't have stable coins, mm -hmm. but, but do you, do you guys not have stable coins on the platform or? Nope. We have no stable coins on the platform. Um, I would say that the most likely reason is Japan doesn't allow stable coins to this point. Um, uh, I don't know the, the real stance on that. I, I'd have to go back and talk to the guys in Japan, but um, I think traditionally they've been kind of negative on stable coins. I would guess that's changing. Um, in the US, we're obviously looking at stable coins, so we will plan to add on stable coins sometime in the future, and the same probably for Europe. Right. Right. Because to me, that's like, that's how you build this interconnectedness, right? At, at the easiest level, right? Is, you know, I feel like a lot, I mean, if you look at USDT volume, a huge percentage of it is in China. Um, and, you know, potentially that's people trying to get their money out of China, which is a different story. But, you know, I think also, obviously, a lot of that's being used for trading. So, so what is next for Bitflyer? I mean, you talked about a lot of things, and I think you've already hit on this, you know, in terms of, you know, simplifying the process, making it easy to onboard users, you know, but, but like, what, what has you excited? Like, what, what, uh, what's coming in 2021 or down the road at least that, 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 that gets you pumped up? Like I said, I, I like the, the, the Neobank uh, piece. So um, the idea of being able to offer interest yield to our retail customers, I think, is really cool. Um, and, and to be able to compete on, on that basis is something where we can definitely beat the banks. 
Um, what I'd really love to see is a day when a cryptocurrency company uh, buys a bank um, and, and you have that consolidation and it's no longer a crypto world and a financial world. It's a financial world where the default technology is blockchain. Right. Do, do you think that's just, more likely than the other way around? Because I think it is. Well, I think you'll find um, there will be some banks that would probably play around with that. But I mean, the basis is for me is kind of, you know, what happened with the, the Internet and traditional companies. Right. You had AOL bought Time Warner, not the other way around. Um, it just I think matters how dumb your competitors are. Right. So. If the banks are dumb, then they will wait until the cryptocurrencies are big enough to buy them out. And if they're smart, then they'll buy them early and then incorporate the technology into their own um, systems. I mean, some of the, the banks are already, like I said, like BNP Paribas was very early into blockchain and, and everything like that. But um, you still have a, a very kind of conservative view operationally within these companies. Um, and things are not going to move that fast. So if there's a, a bolt on solution where they can just buy a company and bolt it on, then I think, you know, it makes sense. But if it's something that's going to touch on their core business, I think they will avoid it. Um, in which case they won't be uh, acting very smart and they'll put themselves at a disadvantage. And so what are the biggest risks for the cryptocurrency space? Mm. Um, Doing dumb things like BitMEX and trying to avoid laws is a good one. Um, I mean, as far as cryptocurrency uh, itself, um, I think we need to prove we add value to people's lives, right? Um, we're not day trading hype um, that there's real value in the things that we're doing. And right now, cryptocurrency is more kind of like penny stocks. You know, you see the same behaviors that you see in penny stocks, pump and dump. Um, behaviors and that's not going to win a lot of fans uh, not with regulators and not with everyday people um, so I think being able to change how cryptocurrency impacts on people's lives and, and embedding it into people's lives and uh, having it deliver value on a day-to-day -day they, they can see that's really what matters and that's what we need to be doing and so what has you most excited about crypto <clears throat> The most exciting thing about crypto? Um, it's a good question. I, I'm excited about lots of things. So it's difficult to pick out one. Um, it can be multiple. It doesn't need to be just one thing. Um, to be honest, I, I, I really do like what's happening with the, um, the automated market makers um, and, and the smart contracts that they've got. Uh, I think that's a, a great solution to um, the problem of decentralized finance. I also think there's some really cool things um, happening in the insurance space to, to how you identify and mitigate risk. Uh, there's a couple of cool projects that are looking at that. Um, Do you mean in DeFi, like DeFi insurance specifically or just insurance more broadly? Uh, and DeFi specifically, um, there was one company, and I just can't remember off the top of my head. Nexus Mutual? Uh, that was one. There was another one. No, I don't remember off the top of my head. But there was a, another one that I th thought was quite interesting, but I just don't remember. But um, also in, in traditional insurance itself, right, one of the main problems and expenses is the claims on insurance. Um, and to be able to have a smart contract where you automatically pay out um, is a massive uh, improvement for insurance. It reduces their costs quite a bit, um, and it's a better customer experience. So, um, and there's a ton of money sitting in insurance, right? Because it's essentially like an asset management. Uh, there's tons of cash just sitting there. If you can provide solutions to them, you know, that's the place to get institutional money moving over is those asset managers and insurance companies. But they're also the most risk averse. Um, so they really need to be convinced that it's going to be safe. And so my final question is, if you could join any large public company as a cryptocurrency advisor, who would you want to join and why? You know, uh, there's, I got two answers to that one. Uh, one, I, I would love to be able to do cryptocurrency with Apple. 
right? Because they are great with design. They're great at making things simple and, and uh, adding better customer experiences. And I think cryptocurrency can really eliminate a lot of problems and frictions in, in our everyday life. Um, and to have kind of their design expertise and, and also just their cash behind it, I think would be a really fun job to do. Um, I think also, you know, the US government would be an interesting place, right? It's not sexy or anything like that, but it can have a large impact. Um, so, you know, with uh, the OCC being run by a former Coinbase guy, I, I think that's a very interesting play. Um, you've got the SEC with Hester Pierce, it's an interesting play. So those type of guys can really uh, impact the entire ecosystem of cryptocurrency in major, major ways um, by changing the, the way of thinking and the way that they support innovation in the United States. Well, I really appreciate your time, Joel. Where, where can people find out more about you and follow you and uh, Bitflyer online? So for Bitflyer, you can just go to bitflyer.com. It will automatically take you to the right territory, depending on where you are. And then myself on Twitter, uh, bitflyer underscore Joel. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time. Oh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it.